Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we're talking to kind of the, the king of Christmas drumming, and he does a ton of other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking to Jerry Grinelli, who was played on some of the biggest Vince Guaraldi hits that are from Charlie Brown's Christmas. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking me, man. I'm excited to hear about um, your entire career. So maybe we we talk about how you got into drumming, but then obviously we'll talk a lot about, because this is kind of a Christmas episode, um, we'll talk about your time um, playing with the Charlie Brown stuff. So so how did you, uh, tell us about you, how did you get into drumming? I just, I was born. <laughs> 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 and, and my dad was, a, always loved to drum, so there was, drums around the house. My uncle, both of them were, did other things. My dad sold poultry. My uncle sold, was a butcher, but there was, you know, we had lived right across the street and I grew up in a real Italian neighborhood uh, with all the relatives in one block. And there was just always music. And there was Jerry who had this gift, you know, uh, there was a lot of learning involved later, but I just love the instrument. I just touched it. It's the first thing I remember. The first thing I remember is, you know, my grandmother's kitchen, just dragging out the pots and pans and yeah. put, having to put them in an order. They had to be in order. <laughs> so I made little drum sets and I just played. I just banged away. But there was always some logic to it. It wasn't just like, you know, kid banging. I was playing i played so i just love to do it it was very natural for me uh, and then you know they just went oh and took me to a teacher when i was very young and in those days there was the national association of rudimental drummers you know and uh i become like a little child whiz I was in the, all the contests beating everybody much older than me uh, I just, you know, I love to practice the drums. I love to sit at a practice pad. I still do. Uh, so it's just, I grew up and my dad, of course, and my uncle made so much music available to me. And I was in San Francisco, one of the great music capitals of American music, you know. So I just got to hear everybody and got to meet people. I got to meet Gene Krupa. He spent a day with me, you know, when I was eight years old. And just... So many people, Shelly Mann and Gene, and you know, they uh, were all so, you know, encouraging and friendly. Gene and I stayed friends his whole life. And then, of course, that continued with the other drummers I learned from, Philly Joe Jones and Elvin Jones. And all that music was in town. And I was, that's all I ever wanted to do. I, you know, never. Never had a day job and got to hear all of it from Lewis Jordan to Red Nichols to, you know, all those people. And it, it, it just it just seems it just seems really natural to me, you know. Yeah. I wanted to be the greatest drummer in the world. Yeah, you're you're up there. I mean, you, you are. F I mean, <clears throat> I've listened to a lot of your stuff and, and a lot of amazing videos and, and you have a very unique style, too, that stands out takes time to find your voice. You know, you steal as much as you can because that's how you learn. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, and I realize later, you don't ever, nobody gets to be the greatest, but you get a seat at the table. And I guess if I have any pride, it's being in that tribe. All my friends are the great drummers. And yeah, it, it's just, it's, uh, <laughs> I go from thinking of it as a life wasted to just <laughs> such a blessing. You know? That's a true musician who just like that constant, like, like one day you're like, oh, this is going great. And the next day you're like, man, I cannot play at all. Like, that's just all musicians have that kind of like interior, uh, that in, in your head sort of like um, struggle. So, yeah, and I, that's fundamental. And if you, you know, I realize now at this point, about to be 80 years old, you know, I fell in love with the practice pad the other night. And of course there was the fame and wanting to perform and all that, but it always comes down to this challenge of you and the instrument. I hate not being able to do something, you know, I hate it. And so I'll work until I can accomplish it. And that's, 
that's what keeps you going because the fame comes and goes. There's money, there's fame. They remember you, they don't remember you, they hate your record, they love your record. You can't ride that wave. You know? No. And it all comes down to, like, for me, it comes down to a peer group, you know, the people who know, who respect you. There's nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. I've, Especially in our, in our circle of drummers. Um, I think it's, we always talk about it on the show, but it's kind of different than other instruments. Where drumming, drumming is kind of a family. The community is very, like, we love our legends like you, and we, we love our, um, you know, the guys, the stories and all that. Um, so yeah. just to have the respect of everyone is, is, is huge. Yeah, because, and, you know, we're the only ones who are competing because there's only one drum slot. Only one drummer gets to play, you know, mm -hmm. and so we're all competing. But those same guys we competed against, we were rooting for, you know, sure. yeah. <laughs> and they're still your friends. I talked to Billy Hart. You know, we're buddies. We're brothers. So, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful fraternity or to be a part of. It's a wonderful it, uh, tribe yeah. to be a part of. Absolutely. Fraternity is a good way to put it because it like, I mean, it's this, this like, but I, I like it too, because you could be, I've seen it where there are guys who are so knowledgeable about vintage drum gear and they're just oh, so God. passionate, but you hear them play and they're not, they're not bad by any means, but they're not Vinnie Kaliuta. They're not these amazing drummers technically, but every, we still love each other. You know what I mean? It's not about how great yeah. you are. It's your passion. Yeah. It's, and my dad had that passion. My dad, that was the great passion of his life. Uh, he, you know, he became a really great Italian dr wedding drummer, man. Hmm. You know, and every night I remember him getting up from the dinner table. And I try to encourage students to do this rather than thinking about career. My dad supported the family. He paid for my drum lessons. But every night the man got up from the dinner table and he would vanish down to his drum set, play along with records, play the drums for two hours. Wow. And Every night. That's uh, awesome. And even when I was much, much, much better than him, he had no ego about saying, show me how to do this. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. P yeah, and people are fanatics. There used to be drum shops, you know, real drum shops. That's all they did, man. No guitars. You know? Oh, yeah. There still are. There's still plenty of them. And, and it's, it's obviously a different time, but, but you know, shout out to everyone who has a drum shop you know a drum shop not not a guitar center but um yeah it's so cool yes yeah, so it was yeah it is kind of this brother sisterhood now and yeah yeah totally. i'm just delighted to be a part of it well let's move forward here so you obviously have a very esteemed career how did you get into um the the professional world leading up to um you know the the gig that is you know you've obviously done many things but i and i i also want to talk about how once we get to the 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 peanuts stuff the charlie brown stuff it's like that's something where i think a lot of people could fall into that um that world of like i don't want to be defined by this one thing but a lot of drummers don't get that one thing so i'd love to hear that too but let's let's lead up to that that's a whole journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I just, you know, I in those times and kids can't do it now. Young people can't do it now. I always saw it as a living. You know, so I worked polka bands, man, I played strip clubs. I did anything to keep earning money. I earned money from the time I was 15 years old playing in tenor bands, I you know, playing in you know, ballroom dancer gigs, anything, 20 bucks, 25 bucks. I was in the union. So, but my passion was always the jazz, you know, always jazz music, which that was, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't understand it. I didn't know how the hell I did it. It sounds like magic. <laughs> sounds like chaos. But I just always made a living, you know, playing the drums. And it didn't matter to me. As long as I could play, I'd rather play that uh, than anything else. So uh, that wound its way to hanging out. It's a lot of hanging out in the, uh, you know, African-American 
parts of San Francisco and going to after hours clubs. And Vince was older than me. Uh, but, and I was studying with Joe Morello and I think Joe's the one who kept telling Vince, Hey man, you know, when Colin Bailey left, who did cast your fate, there was a slot and Vince gave me a shot, you know, mm. and I went, <laughs> the audition was, he called me and said, we're going to Sacramento on the weekend. This, we're going to do, you know, play in this club. So I just went up there and said, man, I'm going to go for it. And I did I played way over my head and uh, burned him to the ground. And he just said, okay, come on. And took me on. And, but it was a lot of, it was a lot of never, it was a lot of stubbornness. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? <laughs> because uh, it was a rough school to go to. People judged you on your playing. And so I just, I just was, uh, I just was determined. Really, I was really determined. You know, as Joe Morello said one time, he said, "You're just dumb enough to make it in this business." <laughs> um, you know, That's funny. That's great. So uh, you know, and I met Joe, and then he took me under his wing, and was my mentor and lifelong friend. And but he never taught me. He never wasn't interested in me playing like him. You know, he interest. He wanted me to learn his technique which is like yoga, which is the reason I could still play now. I don't hurt myself. Sure. Uh, but, you know, it was that, it sounds oversimplified when I say it, but it was a lot of hanging out, a lot of tears, because I wanted to play so good, and I couldn't, you know, and I didn't know how people stopped to tell you. So I kind of do the same thing now. But that, that got me to Vince, and that was the real beginning <clears throat> for me in terms of I was a professional jazz musician, man, 1962. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty far out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but know. that was your big, like, moment, obviously. There's those, there's those pivotal moments of, like, I think there's a difference between – I mean, I think if you're playing the drums and making money – in any way, polka bands, whatever, strip clubs, you're a professional drummer, but but that was like playing with Vince seems like you're like your your marquee jump up. You know what I mean? Your big moment there. That was the shock. Yeah, that was it. And I yeah. knew it. And Vince taught me a lot. He taught me what it was to be a professional jazz musician. Hmm. To be able to play nine o'clock every night. No no uh, screwing off, no copping out, playing for real. He'd get up in your face. Hmm. And that training, and of course, then getting heard, going to New York and playing, because he had a hit record, uh, you know, and then critics writing about you, because you had Ralph Gleason and Leonard Feather and these guys, and they would start to, you know, drop a line here and there. And that's how it, you know, people start knowing who you are. And then maybe the phone rings uh, and you're playing with somebody else. So I got to play with, once people discovered I was in San Francisco, I got to play with a lot of, you know, everybody who came to San Francisco. They didn't have to bring a drummer. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's word of mouth. You know, sure. you're dying, you're afraid the phone won't ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I know it, that. Yeah. You know, and by the time I was 30, you know, I'd been on the cover of Downbeat Magazine for uh, to work with Charlie Hayden and Denny Zeitlin, those records, and, you know, winning the polls and all that stuff. It was fantastic. But Vince was the once, and it was this important relationship with Fred Marshall, the bassist. And it really, I can't underscore that, you know. And, of course, when I left, I didn't pay attention to that music for 40 or 50 years. I didn't want to play it. People wanted me to play it stupidly, and I wouldn't do it. Um, yeah. But I never, and I was annoyed, you know, because I wasn't getting royalties, man. Everybody was making a million dollars, except I, that. Yeah. That's, but, well, back up a little bit. All right, so my, my, let's just like, I mean, obviously, calling this the, the Drum History Christmas special, let's talk, and, and again, I'm sure you had that those feelings of like like everyone does where like I know Ginger Baker had those feelings of like I'm not getting paid for this 
as much as Eric Clapton and stuff. And it's similar to that, but like, all right. So looking at that whole thing, how did, and I'm sure this information is out there, but like with, with Vince Graldi, how, how did he become the, the Charlie Brown guy? Do you know how that relationship started? It was all, you know, people think, especially nowadays with social media, people are thinking they, if you big enough on social media, something happens. But this was all accidental. Hmm. It was purely Lee Mendelssohn. Uh, this piece I do now every year, lots of, lots of concerts, thousands of people come. It's called The Tales of Charlie Brown's Christmas. Cause I, and I talk and I answer these questions. Oh, cool. Uh, but... Lee Mendelssohn, young producer, had only produced one thing. Um, and he had this brainstorm of doing something about Charlie Schultz. And people don't realize it started before that. We did a, we did a TV special uh, documentary called You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. And it was just that Lee driving across the bridge in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge. He hears Vince Guaraldi's music. He hears the trio. And he, the lights go off. He thinks it matches Charlie Schultz perfectly. Mm. He, you know, he just loves the, the lyricism. He, he loves the fact that it's jazz. So he contacts Vince. You know, he didn't even know Vince lives in San Francisco, man. So, and then Charlie Schultz and Vince are, were the same kind of person. Very dark <laughs> humor. <laughs> and... Uh, Charlie Schultz thinks it's perfect. He loves it. Uh, so that special goes nowhere. CBS hates it. But they like a little animation that's in there. So they come up with the idea of a Christmas special. And Charlie, and then we were shocked. You know, there was no animation. There was no music. Uh, and Vince starts putting, you know, he says, we're doing this thing. And we can't see it because of no video. So we rehearse it. And then, and then it's next thing is, wow, Charlie Schultz is coming to hang out at the club and we're getting to be friends. And then we're rehearsing. And then we, we're suddenly going in the studio to record this in three hours. Wow. <clears throat> That's the length you did a record in those days. Unbelievable. No overdubbing. And you just didn't want to be the guy to screw up. Yeah, uh, God, I'm sure. So... We were in, Vince insisted that they be kids and not a professional choir, and we do it. And Lee Mendelson, uh, he and I got to be friends, and before he passed away last year, we spent time together whenever I was in California, and I would tease him about having a bigger house than me. Uh, you know, and he just said, you know, if there wasn't that collection of what, you take one person out of that recording date, how that whole process, it wouldn't have happened. And it's really true. It was the right people in the right time, uh, even including Coca-Cola. <laughs> you know, Coca-Cola paid for the time. CBS refused to put it on the air. They said, when they saw it, they said, look, we hated the jazz music on the last one you showed us. Jazz does not. There was no jazz on television, especially in prime time at Christmas. Oh, man. And they said, well, Coca-Cola, Lord bless them, well, uh, just said, well, we paid for it, so we're putting it on. And uh, CBS said, okay, because we'll put it on because it'll never be seen again. <laughs> Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's so great to have that kind of monstrous corporate wrong. Yeah. Uh, and then people did it. There was no hype. I've seen the postcards and uh, half the viewing audience in the United States watched it. And people wrote in and people have demanded it ever since. And, I mean, it's the largest selling, not Christmas record, jazz record in history. It beats Kind of Blue every year because Kind of Blue doesn't have the advantage of Christmas. Miles became a great fan of the trio. Uh, wow. You know, and a lot of people, a lot of jazz musicians, not to their credit, thought we'd sold, Vince had sold out. You know, they were like, oh, man, you know. But 
It wasn't. It wasn't. No. It was really as good a jazz trio record as you can find out there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you take away some of the like really Christmassy songs on the the album. You know what I mean? Like, there's some that are just like you could listen to any time of the year. But people do, I, man. Oh, I do too. And and it's so funny because um, again, I was saying I just moved to a new. Um, house and we were walking around the neighborhood they did a thing where there's like you know you you put those luminary things outside and people were walking up and down the street and there was a little i say little because they were like in grade school some kids who had drums and a bass and a keyboard set up and they were playing um they were playing music from that album and it was just unbelievable it's oh, yeah everywhere it's it's uh, it's 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 far out i mean it's just really you know, it's in, in it's it's in the Library of Congress for under the American Classics. You know, it's a permanent collection. Uh, it never changed my life. It never changed any because it took time to grow. You know, uh, Vince did all the specials, and then they started doing hiring other people to do them. But Charlie Schultz said, "Please get Vince to do them again." use that music. I don't like all this new music. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And I, you know, I mean, it's countless emails and phone calls from drummers. How, how did you play that? You know, why did you play? How did you play that? Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about that. Cause like before we move on to like the, the aftermath and all that stuff and then the rest of your career. So what was the recording? You saw, I know you said it was kind of a three-hour, um, no overdubs, probably like a four or eight-track kind of... We didn't have no eight tracks. So four-track. Four-track, basically, yeah. Yeah. What was the setup like? And what was your what were your drums you were using and your cymbals? I mean, you're talking to drum nerds here. So what was that all like? I, it's funny because it's a side up there now, people talking about Campco. I was using one of the original Campco drum sets. Cool. The Oakland, yeah. Morello said, hey, man, there's this guy. He's got these great drums. He hooked me up. You know, I flew to L.A., did the, you know, did the drum. All the dream, you know, behind the drums with the sticks in your hand picture. And so I was one of the original. So was Colin Bailey, the original uh, endorsers of Campco. And I still have. I still have a bass drum. Uh, I still have some set uh, parts of sets, you know. Cool. And they were Campco, and it was like, you know, I liked, I was using A Zildjian cymbals, uh, which I still wish I still had. And um, Joe Morello gave me one of the first prototypes of the metal snare drum that Ludwig made for him. So that's the drum. Calf heads. <laughs> and we set up like the trio. You know, the drums were a little bit isolated. The piano was, but we could see each other. Uh, and we never used those kinds of visual cues, but it was pretty much set up like recording studios at that time, you know. Um, and you did, if you made a mistake, you had to, you had to do it over. Yeah, know? so but different we, now. We were pretty much one or two takes. If you listen to the record, you'll notice there's so many fade outs because we couldn't see the video. So, <laughs> so you just played. Yeah, we, there's the fade outs are all along. Hardly anything ends abruptly, you know. Yeah, uh -huh. sure. And we'd been playing the music in the club. That's how we rehearsed. Vince put it in, and we it went pretty fast, man. It went pretty fast. Uh, just maybe two or three takes of anything. Wow, that's amazing. And so people know while we're talking that we. In case someone doesn't know this, because again, there's people out there who are maybe, you know, just not familiar with it, which is pretty unlikely, but it's a Charlie Brown Christmas um, is the album that we're talking about, which if you put it on, you're going to hear it. I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone knows <laughs> knows the music, but I just need to say that's the album we're talking about. If you don't know that music, you don't go to restaurants, airports, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all those, but it's in every music. In, yeah. In the, I mean, literally in the world. Yeah heard it in airports in Europe and Asia and heard it in China. I was in China last year and uh, there it was, man. Wow. But it was just, and it was really, I can't, it was really honestly played. And one of the great benefits of that, besides all the joy that it brought generations, literally, 
uh, it was a lot of people's first jazz concert, first jazz record. Uh, sure. And even the one I'm doing and now, it's a lot of people's first jazz concert. You know? Yeah. And that's yeah. really maybe a really important, important uh, fact of this, you know, uh, that, it, that it did that. It opened those doors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very, um, uh, it's very, all, all, albeit it's, it's obviously the most like cheerful and, uh, I would say it just feels for me when, you know, you're listening to like now it's, it's the week before Christmas right now when we're doing this, uh, you have Christmas music on and it feels, you know, it's cool. It's great. The, the standard stuff. But when that comes on, it just feels more like, um, true and uh just like more there's more musicality to it than and i love all the other christmas songs the burl ives and all that stuff but um there's something about it i mean obviously you know that and it's almost like the recording quality and the just the atmosphere and the sound and the kids who came in and sang there's just like something so like they captured you guys captured like lightning in a bottle yeah, a day. We just, yeah, it's real. That's all I could tell you. It, I think that's why it, people could feel that heart connection, and they they made it happen. You know, I'm surprised. I'll go go play a concert and somewhere, and there's a thousand people. You know, I mean, yeah. just sold out. It's really cool to <laughs> you know <laughs> to know they're all sold out before you get there. But it's. Yeah. And these people are generations I'm meeting. Kids, little kids, who are, you know, their grandparents. Or people bring their parents. You know. So it has that quality. And it was. Uh, Vince's melodies are, everything he wrote are not dark. And they're really complicated. They're hard to play the arrangements. Uh, because they're so precise. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, for a drummer, Vince, there was a simplicity that if you listen to all the Vince Guaraldi records, there's nothing that fancy on there. Yeah. Which yeah. was for me as a 23 year old, because I could, you know, I wanted to play everything I knew. He taught me how to serve the music. So it's very subtle, I'd say. Yeah. That makes it hard. Yeah. Very true. Now, you mentioned before about, and, and I'm sure it's, you know, it's a part of the story about how a lot of times with drummers, like, I mean, this is to this day, one of the most um, popular albums in in history. I mean, it's it's one of those, some of these songs are just, they're everywhere, like you said. But what happens with drummers, which we all fall in that category listening to this, is like, you know, he wrote the the melody, he did all that stuff. So, so when it comes to the royalties and stuff, I'm sure, like you said, where there was, you were mad about that. I mean, you had to be right. Think of Bernard Purdy and yep. guys like that, you know, those, those composers quote who wrote those songs, they didn't write the drum parts, man. Totally. So the musicians union never protected us. They, and there's a, there's an organization called um, music rights organization. And they found all the money for me. So I got some big checks. Good. But yeah, I'm pretty caught up now. But Good. I think that over the years as drummers, nobody relates to us as composers. And we are composing. Yes. We're composing those drum parts. We're arranging that music by the how we play it. Uh, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover without Steve Gadd's drum hook that tune is nothing yeah you know, perfect example it, without that forget it you know yeah uh, but i it's part of the nature of that instrument and that's that's why I, at some point i due to the inspiration of max roach and a couple of people i i started i decided i wanted to be a leader and make my own band my own music you know uh which there's not that many of us who did that. Mm-hmm. So I got, you know, 28 records to my credit that are mine. <laughs> wow. Uh, That's awesome. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's the nature of the instrument. It's a, 
it's a it's an instrument that it controls and has so much energy and yet is in a serving position yeah and i mean did you hit a point where like i can tell you i have a one and a half year old we in the last week we have watched the charlie brown the, the you know the original you know the the christmas special that we're talking about probably three times like in the last week did you get sick of did you not want anything to do with it did you not want to hear it or did you separate yourself from it for a while when i left i left shortly after it was done hmm. i was 24 and then i went on to why well, you know and of course when you're that age and you have and you're out there fighting those battles of, you know not playing the hi-hat on two and four and, uh which really disturbed people I and mean, the things we were trying to do with the drums at that time <laughs> yeah uh, trying to go forward and, and imply time and understand how it works and getting to see how the drums is another voice in the band. You know, I could play on chord changes as good as any horn player. They forced me to learn that. And uh, so I let it be and I didn't like people always bringing it up. Or it was kind of a, and then I just wouldn't touch it. And then my manager, Colin McKenzie, uh, slowly, <laughs> slowly would say, hey, these people, uh, you know, PBS wants to do something about Charlie Brown's Christmas. So I would do the interview and then uh, I couldn't do it because I didn't want to be play it as a caricature of it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to be like some guy in a Holiday Inn playing Charlie <laughs> Brown, you know. Like, and then a the guy. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, man, I'm, that's where it all ends up. And uh, yeah. PBS, you know, like calling me and they want to know this story. And then being stopped by people who wanted to introduce me to their grandson. And I began to realize that, hey, man, you grow up. This is a great blessing in your life. And yeah. You're mature enough now to be able to do it but i couldn't figure out how so one day at one night literally i uh i just saw it as a piece and i called colin and i said hey man it's going to be called tales of charlie brown christmas i had a great trio who i had recorded with before and these guys could play it because every musician damn near every jazz musician i ever met grew up with this mm -hmm. and uh I said, it's going to really be for real. I'm not playing it just by rote. We play the heads right. The Schultz family was so great because they let me use uh, some clips. So I have animation and a children's choir. And I said, it has to be a benefit for educating people for jazz. Oh, great. Yeah. And he said, let me go with this, man. And all of a sudden, we had 12 concerts. And I said, it has to be a good payday for me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, you need, you get what's coming to you. I mean, you deserve it. So I could see it as a composer and then I could do it, you know. And so every night it's fresh. The trio plays the hell out of it. Uh, and, and I play, you know, it's like every night I'm, I could be going out and playing with any of my avant-garde, quote, friends because I feel that same pressure of playing the drums right. Yeah. Has to sound a certain way, no big sound systems. It has to sound like a 50s, 60s trio. But I could see it as a composer, so I could come back to it. And then on the new record with Jamie Saft, New York trio record, I did read Jamie, who's a genius young piano player. If you don't know Jamie, you should go out and look at Jamie Saft. Um, and he we play cast your faith to the wind and we he said man we got to play christmas time is here please for me <laughs> so we recorded it and it's brand new uh, so i think that's your as an artist i think you finally grow up at some yeah point. well and like you, i said before i mean a lot of people out there i mean i think we always hear about it where like um the big band who do, like like um, Led Zeppelin might not want to play Stairway to Heaven. You know what I mean? And they, but like, people don't get that opportunity to even have that problem. That's a that's a nice problem to have. 
it's a very wonderful problem to have. And it's very rare for, for us jazz musicians to have that kind of problem. Uh, yeah. And I, I just really, sounds corny, but at this point in my life, I, I, I don't view it as having anything to do with me. No. It's more about the people who come and, and, you know, so many kids. And I just did something on Canadian radio, some 10 year old kid. His mom sent me a video of him playing Linus and Lucy. And they happened to live near me, so I said, come by. And then CBC wanted to do an interview. And this little kid is trying to learn this music. And it's really cool, man. That's great. Uh, but that's, I think that's, yeah, the history of jazz and the, the drumming. And, you know, you realize we did have some pop heroes, Gene Krupa, Cozy Cole. And then, you know, Morello was like huge, man. Oh, yeah. God. So I think some of that rubbed off on me, that possibility that you could, that could happen, you know. Yeah, yeah, really. Uh, Especially, and Gene comes up in a lot of episodes, but just how he has, he sort of transcended the drum set and it became something else, which is kind of what this album did, where it transcended just music and... Yeah, and obviously it's a right place, right time, right animation, right characters. Yeah, everything was like perfect. Yes, it was just one of those things. I have, I have no idea how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be part of it now. Yeah, really. Now, um, you beyond, you know, this obvious, your like, your your masterpiece here, we'll call it. You sure. have other tons of other work and now you've done a lot of, and I've posted some videos that I think, you know, people have seen probably, you know, I think a, probably about six months ago, I found a really some cool videos of you. I mean, it's very, it's, it's not Christmas music. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> very cool, different, unique, like we said, quote unquote, avant-garde kind of more, um, just out would, there stuff. I just wanted to play it. I mean, you know, the drums, you know, I just, they were so fascinating. They were endless, you know? I mean, it's yeah. endless. So, yeah, and, and how they're used in the music, we changed that. I'm proud to be a part of changing that. Yeah, pop records. Uh, that I was, you know, other hit records I was on. You're right about changing the sound because a lot of stuff you'll do is very like it's not just playing the drums the standard way it's like using things and <laughs> just experimenting it's very i guess experimental is the best way to kind of like put it all together but um that had to be that has to be freeing to kind of be like and i'm sure part of that deep down you're probably still like okay i'm not just the christmas guy here's some really cool different stuff right yeah, at this point, my greatest fear. I mean, I was talking to someone. It takes years to find your voice. You know, to find your voice in music is the greatest gift. If a record comes on, somebody knows it's me because of the sound I get, because of the way I phrase things, usually because I can't figure out what one is. But, you know, it's like, that's that took years to find. It took years to find. It took years of of study to to listen to Kenny Clark to go back, you know, to thinking that actually you think you're like really avant garde and you go back and you listen to Baby Dodds, uh, the great drummer in the yeah, you know, who was like an archetype, and you listen to those guys and you go. Oh my God, this was in there. He was doing that. He was playing yeah. melodically. Yeah. That you know? happens all the time now that I've seen with gear, where there's a lot of things where you'll be like, um, oh man, there's this awesome new invention that happened. And, and, you know, things are really modern and different. But then you look back at, like, I was looking at like a 40s Gretsch catalog, and there's like a hi hat stand that has like two hi hats connected. And it's like a bar, and it's like, they were doing wild. It's the drums have always been out there and, and wild and different. There were double bass drum pedals, you know. Yeah, made in the 
20, in the, uh, before the 20s, out of wood. Hmm. And uh, so the technology, I mean, I never, when I was a kid, I grew up with symbols hanging off a piece of leather. No hands. And, and you couldn't even ride it. <laughs> you know, yeah. you had to use the hi-hat to ride things. You know, yeah. you couldn't even do that at first because it was a low boy. And then it became a hi-hat. Got up. Uh, of course, yeah. Baby Dots had one that got up to where he could play it. You couldn't tune heads. It was a big deal when you had one. The top head was tunable. The bottom head was still tacked on. Uh, yeah. Calf heads. You know? And it's a very, people forget that it's a very unique American instrument. That and the electric guitar. Yeah. And, and we lived through, when I learned to play, there was only one way to learn to play rudimentally which had no relationship to the drum set. But now there's tons of technique. I hear these drummers, I look online, man, and, you know, done drum clinics where, good God, the things they can do are amazing. Yeah, it's it's a different world now, that's for sure, than what you, what you were doing, but I don't think you can have one without the other. I don't think there'd be, let's call it Chop, chop City <laughs> now without the very clean, smooth, earlier jazz stuff it's kind of it's all just a part of the what makes drums great you know yeah jazz drumming is still i mean no the the, the, the uh without getting too scientific the body that you of, of knowledge you have to have you have to understand chord changes you have to know a form you know uh you have to be able to move a band through a set of chord changes in odd time signatures. I mean, it's incredibly sophisticated, it's considering it's an instrument that started out as a, as a language instrument. That's what it started out as, as a ritual instrument. Yeah. And it was a way to, you know, uh, for people to communicate. Yeah. Exactly. And, send messages. And even with war and battles, it'd be sending messages down the line. And I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful, consider it was the first instrument that in voice. Yeah. Somebody banging on a log uh, and creating a, a beat that said danger. You know, I'm sure that was the first one, right? <laughs> of <laughs> like, course. Yeah. They're going to eat us. Tired. Yeah. Eat us. Run. <laughs> <laughs> play this beat you know yeah and, uh, so uh, we're really getting into drumhead stuff but it's it's i think that's important to realize and what's being lost now as a, if i could be a grumpy old guy is there's i watch people do technique you know but there's no music man they're not playing music they're just it's it's uh sport sure yeah. that's a good way to put it it's they've changed it into sport and uh it's fantastic but it it's separating it out and that's wonderful i could never do that uh, but and i'm not interested in that it, and but then you have Vinny and you have other great drummers in that then you know in that form that are you know incredible musicians Incredible musicians. Yeah. yeah. I can't think of my favorite. One of my favorites is the guy with uh, Sting. Oh, man. Just that's, to that's, wait. There's v Vinny. Who else has played with him? Uh, Josh Freeze has played with him. Um, yeah. It's, oh, God, I can't remember. Omar Hakim, I think, played with him. Yeah, but the way, if you listen. Oh, Stuart Copeland. Yeah, it's not him. It's the last. I think it might be Vinny, actually. Yeah, Vinny. That snare drum sound where they have to put it, but the way he he'll, he'll just play three bells of the cymbal in the right place in a song, it makes the whole tune. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. genius, man. Yeah, that's musicality and cleanness, and I think, and I always say this that I think if people are playing the drums, that's the best thing. Period. Play the drums, but but if you're if you're always playing alone. Um, which I understand too. Like I've fallen on that again, having a baby and like, I, I used to play in a band all 
a bunch of different bands. And then I started the podcast and had a baby and I was like, okay, now I'm just like playing alone and it's, it's just a different thing, but you got to do what you got to do. But it's very different when you sit down with other people and you're not like, okay, you don't go nuts all the time. You, that's no. bad for the music. It's, no, no, you're not going to, you're not going to work doing that. man. You're going to yeah. work. You're going to work, uh, because you play for the music, not for yourself. And that's Absolutely. the problem with people. You know, people send me things and they go, look at this 15 year old and he's playing along with the record, he's playing along with, and he's learned all the parts on that CD, right? For this yeah. complicated drum part. But the person who's playing with it didn't think up those parts. Mm -hmm. They're just copying them. You know what I yeah. mean? And uh, that's sport. It's beautiful, but it's sport. Yeah. I did a big drum clinic somewhere. I just, I couldn't, I was going out there and there's, you know, all these drums and there's right in the med middle of the stage is a regular old jazz drum set. So the only thing I could do is I just walked out and started playing it backwards with my back to the audience and started the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, slowly moved around it, but I, uh, it's fascinating. And because, and drummers are more nerdish than anybody else. <laughs> we are, we love it. Oh, and then, man. Uh, I mean, if, if you're listening to the show right now, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're probably a nerd and you're one of us <laughs> and, uh, and accept yeah. it. Cause it's, yeah. 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 And I still am like, Hey man, what are you doing there? How'd you do that? Give no. Yeah, people don't get it who aren't drummers. They'll go like I don't know. I mean, it's like it's not a hobby. It's a it's a life it's, it's a life choice. <laughs> you yeah. <know? laughs> You're holding on to like you know, K Zildjian symbols. I've got a 1943 K Zildjian. It's like, wow, man, cool, you know. Yeah. That's uh, so cool. You no, know, people go, "How what kind of symbols?" I go, "Whatever they were giving me at the time." So, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Got forty okay. symbols sitting downstairs, and oh, I give them man. to my students. And then, but I, a lot of my don't. <laughs> well, you got to keep them. But hey, on that note, that's a good kind of transition here as we kind of wrap up. So you teach. Why don't you tell people how they can like find you, how they can take lessons from you know the master himself and uh, learn more about you? How do they do that? I'm not doing the Zoom lessons. They can go to jerrygrinelli.com. Uh, and that'll lead you to a thing called Creative Music Workshop website. Because okay. uh, I like, I, uh, I don't like to give private drum lessons. Okay. Because it, I, you know, I, in all honesty, uh, it just bores me, man. Uh, <laughs> and it's usually a solvable problem. You know, I like to help people with their hands and the Morello system. And on practice pads, if anybody wants to learn that, I can teach you that. But the rest, I like to teach the instrument in context. I think it's very important to teach the musical in the instrument in a context. You know? sure. uh, but Creative Music Workshop is, is, uh, is done in Halifax. There's one online January 17th. But it really uses... Uh, improvising and i'm interested in teaching that more than the drums at this point in my life uh, i have a few students here but anybody who wants to write to me grinelli drums man you know and i'll answer questions about it great because i do love to talk about it as you can tell oh yeah well you're in the right place and i'll spell it. it's j-e-r-r-y g-r-a-n e l l i dot com jerry grinelli dot com um, yeah sure. Hey, at the risk of getting weird emails, uh, Grinelli drums, one word is at Gmail is my email. And I will answer questions. I'll, I do love it. You know, I mean, yeah. when I, when I was studying with Morello, I drove him anywhere he wanted to go. Cause he was going to talk about drums all the time. <laughs> yeah. I've heard we've, we've had, um, so Steve Fiddick, who's a great drummer, did a biography episode on Joe. Yeah. And then I've, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I've I've heard of his, and I've I've been taking lessons with one of his friends and a student of Stone, Barry James, who's become a good friend. Um, and yeah. I've heard just Joe Morello. I mean, he's he's the. It doesn't matter again if you're 
a pro or an amateur, you can be, you know, he's, he's a drum nut like all of us. Um, Oh yeah. 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 But yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to talk about it. Uh, and you know, uh, I love to teach it. That's great. And I love the sound of it. And, and, uh, I, yeah. you know, man, I'm a complete nerd, man. I'm all in. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, I'm glad we had you on here and I, and I should have done this at the beginning. So, um, I always say who kind of recommended the episode with the other morning, like I said, on our probably third time in the week watching the Charlie Brown special, my wife said, I think she was just Googling and, uh, she recommended, she was like, Oh my God, you should talk to G-. like, he, she Googled you and found, and I, I'd seen your stuff obviously before, like I said, but, and I, I, I know you were great, but she said, why don't you email Jerry Grinelli about getting him on and talking about, you know, this stuff for a Christmas episode. So my wife, Abby was the one who, um, this was, this was her idea. So, um, we can, we can all thank her for that, but, uh, <laughs> we owe so much to our wives. <laughs> yes, we do. We probably don't admit it enough. I know I don't, but, um, that's the yeah. wives of drummers. Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm picking up an electronic set today cause I moved and again, having a baby I'm trading. Oh, I'm all about cool. trading. I'm picking up a, um, I traded a, an old piece of audio gear that I don't use for this guy as a brand new electronic set. So I'm like, it, if I, playing is playing. I know it's preferred. I love the acoustic drums. And I, I have multiple sets, but I'm like, I just want to play and not wake the baby up at night. So <laughs> No, it, it doesn't matter. It's wonderful. You know, my mom went to every drum lesson I had. Wow. When I was a young kid, she could tell across the room. She'd say, that paradiddle doesn't sound right. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Cool. Well, hey, Jerry, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And again, people can find you at jerrygrinelli.com. Yeah. Um, and just you're a super nice guy. So I'm sure people will reach out and just want to talk to you. And um and see your schedule and hopefully and check out videos, which I'll be sharing and I'll post um, Jerry's website in the kind of description of this episode. So again, um, Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you for doing this. I mean, thank you for having the podcast and there's some great stuff up there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jerry. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>